good evening. Welcome to Cornerstone. We're so glad you're with us tonight on our evening Wednesday night prayer service. Stand with us. We're going to sing page 147 out of the Cornerstone hymnal. I feel like traveling on. great tonight. Brother Donnie Hart, please open us in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the ability to come to church this evening. Just thank you for the time that Rick and Tanya were able to get away and have a little bit of uh, away time and be able to clear their minds a little bit and come back to us a little renewed. Just uh, be with uh, Brother right now as he gives us his message this evening. Thank you for the ability to come together uh, and everything we say and do, Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. Remain standing. We're going to sing page 82 farther along. But just real quick before we do that, I just want to tell you how much I appreciate Brother Donnie Hart. Him and Bethany will be moving, and he's got a job promotion. Uh, but you know what? He's been working in the sound ministry, I think, since you were a teenager, probably before, right? I mean, a long, long time. And 20, how many? 20 years. And he just does it behind the scenes, doesn't ask for recognition or anything like that. None of those guys do. But we're so thankful for men like him who just work behind the scenes and are can continue on. He's going to be missed, so Brother Sean's going to need some help in the sound room, right, Brother Sean? Amen. He says big amen back there. But I just want to just just um, just say something about Donnie and what a good job he's done. He's been very, very faithful to that position in the sound room, and he'll be um, missed very much. All right, farther along, page 82. Tempted and tried.
here's Brother Bradley. Well, good evening. It's good to have you here tonight. Welcome to Cornerstone. Whether you're physically present or you're joining us online, hope uh, you receive a blessing from the Lord. And yes, you are stuck with me tonight. Uh, we want to be in prayer for our pastor and his family as they're on vacation and that they get uh, relaxed and refreshed as they come back to us. We want to pray for them having safe traveling mercies as they travel. We do want to remember that this Sunday, we're having a fifth Sunday format. So that means after the morning service, we will be eating lunch here, and we're asking that you bring sandwiches and sides that you would normally have uh, with sandwiches, and we'll be eating those. And then once we're done eating, we'll have our afternoon service, and then we'll be um, gone by mid-afternoon. So that's this Sunday, and if you can, make sure, um, try to bring enough for yourself and then uh, another person or two so that if we have guests visiting, there's plenty of food we can offer them. And I believe that's all the announcements I had. Did you have anything? No. So let's, uh, let's thank God for the money that's collected, and let's remember that we can give here or we can give online bring in the church office, but we do want to thank God as he provides us money that we can have a part in furthering his work. Dear God, we know that you sustain us, you provide for us, and we are thankful for that and all the blessings you give us. And as we give back a, a portion of what you've lent to us, we just pray that we would use it wisely to see souls saved, Christians edified, the gospel spread around the world. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. The missionary letter that I have is Jerry and Nancy Novak, our missionaries to Kenya. It says, Dear friends in Christ, during the month of April, while we were confined to our houses for Sunday services, we made the best of it. On Easter Sunday in particular, we had two other missionary families with us, as well as our household and some friends. We had a wonderful time remembering the resurrection of our Lord and had, got, um, had good fellowship. We were also joined by more then one family electronically, Philippians 3.10, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and his, the fellowship of his sufferings being made comfortable unto his death. This past Sunday, we were able to go back to church after the imposed lockdown. It was good, so good to get together again in person, even though there were has been a lot of rain in the area where we live. Many of our folks came to our services. It was a wonderful Mother's Day. We have a special project with our brother, uh, missionary Peter Kinsaban in Tanzania. His permits for working in the country are coming up for renewal again soon. They have been have to be renewed more often than ours in Kenya, and they are very costly. We need to raise $750 for the project, hoping that the Tanzanian government still renews the permits and does not impose some other fees connected to the renewals. Please pray for the, this procedure and for the cost of it. Brother Peter is still able to preach to the potential thousands of people every Sunday morning via loudspeaker and to the folks in his normal church services as well. He has been doing uh, so faithful in his service to the Lord. We are still able to, uh, we are still in the process of training a few people in our Bible Institute doing self-study to help prepare them for our mission, for the ministry. 
also we have a group of our men who have been involved with with a preacher's class learning how to prepare different types of sermons and delivering this message at appropriate times. Please pray about these various folks studying for the ministry. During April, we had a fun time visiting Nyerbury National Park, seeing lots of beautiful animals. Thanks for your faithful prayers and support. Jerry and Nancy Novak, our missions to missionaries to Kenya. All right, thank you, Brother Scott. Just stand with us one last time before Brother Brent comes. Page 30, we want to sing that there's something about that name, the name of Jesus, amen? All right, let's uh, have a quick word of prayer and we'll get started. Dear God, we just pray as your word is brought forth tonight, your Holy Spirit would work. Give me the words to say and that uh, it would be prosperous and beneficial. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, tonight we're going to be talking about corrected vision. Now, some of you are like me. You need these or contacts to be able to function. And without my glasses, I'm in trouble. But you know, regardless if you wear glasses or not, we're all in need of correction in our spiritual vision. And that's what we want to talk about tonight is how we can gain corrective lenses. So we're going to start by looking at our own vision. So the first thing we want to note with our vision is our vision can lead us astray. You know, if I take off my glasses and I try to follow directions, try to get somewhere, more than likely people are going to come out looking for me because I'm not going to make it. I have very poor vision. But you know, our, our spiritual eyesight does much the same thing. If you're here Sunday pastor talked about a man that had this problem where his vision led him astray and that was Lot. In Genesis chapter 13, 10 through 12, it reads, and Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord, destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar, then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated the one from the other. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of plain and pitched his tent toward Sodom. And the pastor went through talking about, yes, he, he pitched his tent toward Sodom, but it wasn't very long that he was in Sodom. And why? Because when he was given that choice, he looked... And his eyes saw the well-watered plain, and instead of consulting anyone, including God, he chose based on his own eyesight. And it got him into trouble 
And the reason that he had to part with Abraham was because of all his goods, that the land could not support them. He ended up losing all those because of relying on his own eyesight. You know, we often, if we don't look to God, we stand to lose. And we all have lost when we haven't consulted God, went basically on what we thought was best. And Lot certainly did. And Proverbs 12, 15 says, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. Lot had at his disposal of a very wise man, a righteous man, Abram. But we read nowhere where he sought counsel. Again, he saw what he thought was good for him. He was sure, I'm, I'm certain, that this is what I need. This is going to fulfill the needs of my livestock and so forth. And it caused his ruin. So, we need to remember that our own sight will lead us astray. Secondly, it deceives. You know, if I take off my glasses and I approach someone, I may call them by the wrong name. Uh, that's probably not a good example because I sometimes call people by the wrong name anyway. But... <laughs> You know, it can cause me a lot of trouble sometimes if I can't see people clearly, especially if I approach Miss Penny and, and call her Amy and talk to her like I would my wife because I can't see her. That's going to cause a lot of trouble with my wife. You know, I can make excuses. Honey, I didn't have my glasses on. I didn't know. But I can tell you right now, I would be eating cold food for a few days. So that wouldn't be an excuse. <clears throat> so it deceives us. Now Solomon dealt with this, did he not? Solomon had great wisdom, but yet he was deceived because he took wives of the heathens and they led his heart unto false gods and he turned from the very God that had given his wisdom, his wealth, his prestige unto false gods. We read 1 Kings eleven thirty three. Because that they have forsaken me and have worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and Milcom, the god of the children of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways to do that which is right in mine eyes, to keep my statutes and my judgments as did David his father. So Solomon did not keep the statutes that David, his father, had kept, and he was king. So what happened? The entire nation followed him, and they fell back into idolatry, which wasn't difficult for the children of Israel to do. That was ingrained in them from being in Egypt. And they were deceived because they're false gods that can do nothing for them. Isaiah 44, 19 says, And none considereth in his heart, neither is there knowledge nor understanding to say, I have been part of it, that being a tree, and the fire, yea, also I have baked it bread upon the coals thereof. I have roasted flesh and eaten it. And shall I make the residue thereof an abomination? Shall I fall down, fall down to the stock of a tree? So that sounds ludicrous. Yeah, they, they build a house with part of the tree or they cook on it. And then they take part of it and fashion some image. And then they, they worship it as, as if it could do something for them. And Solomon, with all his wisdom, did the same thing. And we think, well, how could they do that? But, you know, don't we do the same thing? Don't we get deceived and we put all our focus on something we think is going to fulfill us, bring pleasure, happiness, but then we get it and we're left empty-handed or we realize this isn't what I thought it was. When we had what gave us blessings, fulfillment, when we were 
with God. But again, that was because we relied on our own vision and were deceived. And then thirdly, it's just fundamentally flawed. It's flawed. You know, I take off my glasses. There's not much I can do. But the only thing I can do well with my glasses off is sleep. I mean, outside of that, I'm in trouble because my vision is very flawed. Judges tells us about the children of Israel when they relied on their own eyes, their own eyesight, and the problems they ran into. In Judges chapter 17, verses 1 through 5, talks about this man called Micah and his mother. And they had this silver, and they took 20 shekels of it, and they made a false god with it. And then he put it in his temple of false gods. So it wasn't the only one he had. He had others. And then he took his son and he consecrated him and made him a priest in this temple of his. Now this is very clearly against God's word. In Exodus 20, 3 through 4a, it says... Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. And yet this Israelite does that. And then Numbers 3.12, it says, And behold, I have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel, instead of all the firstborn the openeth the matrix. And that was from the plague, if you remember, um, the Passover and all the firstborn were killed. So all the firstborn of the nation, children of Israel were dedicated to the Lord. And he said, instead of taking them, the tribe of Levi will be my priest. So he says, therefore, the Levite shall be mine. And yet this Micah, who was not a Levite, makes his son a priest. How could this happen? Well, the next verse tells us, Judges 17.6, in those days, there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. So this man may think he was doing good, doing right, but he was relying on his own vision and it left God out, it was not using God's vision. And it's just a note that it says there was no king in Israel. <clears throat> you know, we don't have that excuse, do we? Because we have a king. Christ has come, he's the king of kings, lord of lords, but yet we do what's right in our own eyes. And then a couple of chapters later, we get another story about this Levite that has a wife and he's traveling and he stops in a town of Benjamin and the Benjamites um, take this wife of this Levites, and they abuse her all night long so that in the morning she dies. Well, the Levite takes her and tells the nation of Israel about what's happened to her. And they take action, and they come against the tribe of Benjamin, and they kill every man, woman, and child down to 400 or 600 of the Benjamites. Kill almost every one. They realized they went a little too far, and they realized, whoa, wait, we've almost wiped out an entire tribe of <clears throat> our brethren. So they said, we got to fix this. Well, they had already made a covenant not to give any of their children, any of their daughters, <clears throat> to a Benjamite ever. So they find out some people who had not made this promise, and they go and forcibly take virgins and give them to the Benjamites. So atrocity upon atrocity are described in 19 through 21 of Judges. And then the end of 21 through 25, it tells why this could happen. It says, in those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Yes, it is the same verse we read in Judges 17, 6. We see the same offenses repeated and the same reason. You know, have we ever found ourselves immersed in a sin? 
in a problem, in something that's causing us difficulty, and we come to the Lord and repent and say, God, if you help me, if you get me out of this, I have learned my lesson. I am never going to fall prey to this again. And we say it in full confidence. But then a few months later, a year later, a few years later, where are we at? We find ourselves in the exact same sin or problem. And we look, we come to ourselves and we just shake our heads thinking, how could I repeat this? Well, just like the Israelites did in Judges where they repeated the same offense over and over and over again, it's because they relied on their own eyesight, their own vision instead of God's. And we do the same thing. So we have to learn not to rely on our vision because it's flawed. So what can be done? Well, Proverbs 21.2. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. All right, so it says, well, yeah, every man, when he's doing something, he thinks it's right, it's good for him. But then it says, but the Lord pondereth the heart. So the answer has to do with God. So, what about God's vision? God's vision. Well, first off, we see it's clear, meaning it's not flawed like our vision. 1 Corinthians 13, 7. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I am known, also am known. So it says, we don't see clearly. We see through a glass darkly. We cannot see clearly. We have flawed vision. But it says when we see him face to face, then we're going to be able to see clearly. Well, We can do that now. We can obtain God's vision to help us through life. So we need to help with our flawed vision by getting God's clear vision. And secondly... We know that God's vision is true. Our vision can deceive us, but God's vision is true. 1 John 5, 20. And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding, that we know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ, that is true God and eternal life. Well, if it's truth, then it's not going to be deception. So if we can gain God's vision and apply it to our vision and see through his lenses, then that's going to help us not be deceived. So God's vision is clear, it's true, and then we see it is long range. So it won't lead astray because it sees the beginning from the end. Isaiah 46, 9 through 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall, counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. So it says, declaring the end from the beginning. His vision sees all the way back, and future to events that have not taken place. With that type of vision, you're not going to go astray. But we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, so we can easily go astray when we're relying on our own eyesight. So we need to incorporate God's, which sees the beginning from the end. And on top of those three, it being clear, true, and long-range, It's also commanded to gain God's vision. Deuteronomy 13, 18 says, When thou shalt hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God to keep all his commandments, which I command thee this day, to do that which is right in the eyes of the Lord God. So not what's in our own eyes right, but do what's right in God's eyes. It says to keep all his commandments, which I command thee this day. 
So not only is it beneficial, but it, God also expects it. We know that when we become a child of God, we're no longer our own. We're bought with a price. We are God's. And he's put certain, he has certain expectations for us and even commands us. We have the great um, commandment to go out, preach the word, to make disciples. And we do that by God's word. And then, so it's commanded. But how do I, I mean, well, let's put it this way. We need to remember it's obtainable because we can get discouraged. Because, yeah, it's commanded, but, boy, I get in a mess all the time. But we see examples of the Bible where it's obtainable gaining God's vision and being pleasing to God. 1 Kings 15, 9 through 11 says, And in the 20th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, reigned Asa over Judah. And 41 years reigned he in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Makak, the daughter of Abishalom. And Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did David his father. So it's obtainable where we, God can look at us and say, hey, there's someone that does right. Now that doesn't mean that we're perfect. 1 Kings 22, 43 says, Jehoshaphat was 30 and 5 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 20 and 5 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Azubah, the daughter of Shilheh. And he walked in the ways of Asa, his father. He turned not aside from it, doing that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. Nevertheless, the right high places were not taken away, for the people offered and burnt incense yet in the high places. So here's a man that God says, hey, here's someone who did right in my eyes. But in that same verse, he talks about how he wasn't perfect. The high places were not taken down. None of us are going to be perfect, and God knows this, because even though we're saved, we're a child of God, we still have our old nature. And that's not going to be removed from us until we get our glorified body after we leave this life, until the Lord's return. But we can still have... God's vision to a point where he looks at it and say, hey, here's a person that's doing right in my eyes. So if our own vision's not going to be pleasing to God, not going to allow us to be viewed as right in God's eyes, <clears throat> how do we obtain God's vision so that we can receive God's blessings? All right, well, first off, It's through the Bible. If God is the creator, then he knows he has, well, let's start with he has ownership of everything. He has full right to make the rules. And he has, and he's left us his book on how to live and watch right. It's at our disposal So we need to make use of it. What can it do for us? Well, first off, we know the Bible can correct our flawed vision. Proverbs 19.8. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The command of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. So yeah, our vision is flawed, But the commandments of the Lord are pure. That means not flawed, perfect. And they'll enlighten our eyes. So taking our flawed vision, it can enlighten them and correct it um, so that we have better vision than we have. And then it can correct our vision that leads us astray. Psalm 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And then Proverbs 3, 5 through 7. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. 
Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. So if we don't want to be led astray, we don't want to be right in our own eyes. We want to be right in God's eyes. And that's going to happen by incorporating God's word into our life. And then the Bible corrects our vision that deceives us. 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. So they shall turn their ears away from the truth. They have the truth but yet they turn away from it. So there's deception there because they bring in false doctrines and that sound good, even right. And that's because they're relying on their own vision, their own eyes, instead of God's vision that would allow them to see clearly. And again, without reading it and studying it, you're not going to know what the right doctrine is. So we need to incorporate it into our lives. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 12. So we have the Bible. We need to incorporate that. And we see that in Deuteronomy 12.1. These are the statutes and judgments which ye shall observe to do in the land which the Lord God of thy fathers giveth thee to possess it all the days that ye live upon the earth. So had he given the Ten Commandments, his law, and he says, These are a statute and judgments that you should live by all the days that you live upon the earth. So that would be in our terms today, the Bible. So we need to live by it all our life. <clears throat> but it needs support. We look down at view verses in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 12, 8. It says, You shall not do after all the things that you do here this day, every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes. Now, this is just a few verses later from 12, 1, which very clearly tells us God's given his statutes, his commandments, but then he gets down 12, 8 and says, You're not going to do like you're doing here now. There needs to be something else so that you're right in my eyes. Now, what was that? Well, at this time, they were in the wilderness. And they were traveling from place to place. Yeah, they had the law, but it was hard for them to fulfill all of it and to keep the statutes because you know how it is when you're moving or you're traveling. It's kind of chaotic. Um, you can lose focus. The tabernacle often was torn down as they moved. They couldn't go there to worship the Lord, go present themselves before the priests and so forth. And this led them to problems. And that's where we pick up in verse 8. You're not going to do like you did here because when you move in the promised land and I give that land to you, what's going to be true? Well, originally they erect a permanent tabernacle in one place that they can come do the sacrificial system, present themselves before the priests. There's order, the chaos is gone, and they can more easily fulfill the commandments of the Lord, but then they get the temple. So, in our terms today, we would say it's the church. So, yeah, God's given us his Bible, but he needs support. So, God gave us his church to help us keep his commandments. What's true of the church? Well, it says that Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having sprout a wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So God thought so much of the church that he gave himself for it. If God 
loved it so much and Christ did that he would sacrifice his life so the church could be born and we're a child of God, then we ourselves should also love his church and want to be a part of it. And then it also solidifies God's word so that we can better have God's vision. Church also is a place we can find friends that gives us wide counsel. And, of course, the pastor is giving wise counsel, but that's found within the church. If we're separated from the church, we don't get that. So Proverbs 27, 13 says, Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the counsel, countenance of his friend. The church ought to be a place that you can find people that's going to sharpen you that's going to better you, enhance your spiritual walk. And we should be one of those people. We should be endeavoring to be one of those people that can help our brothers and sisters. Proverbs 19.20, Hear counsel and receive instruction that thou mayest be wise in thy latter end. So church is a place we can come to get counsel. If we're only reading the Bible... That's good, but it's not the full, all the means that God gave us to be able to get his vision. So we can come and get instruction from wise men, wise women, not only from the pastor, but from brothers, sisters in Christ. And again, we should endeavor to be one of those people that can also strengthen our brothers and sisters. And then the church of place should be a place that is preaching and teaching God's word. That is found in the church. That should be a focus of the church. Acts 27, and upon the first day of the week, that would be Sunday, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. He preached a long time. But they came here, the church, to hear God's word. And when we come to church, our focus should be to gain more instruction from God's word, to hear God's word proclaimed. Why? Not only for our betterment, so that we're not led astray. Matthew 7, 15 says, Beware of false prophets that come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. By God's word... And from the instruction and proclamation of God's word at church, it can help us from being led astray by false doctrine and false teachers. So, as we begin to move or transition past COVID, you know, it's, it's been a tough time past over a year, year and a half. But as we begin to get past it, as we're vaccinated, the virus starts to become a thing of the past, we need to once again make church a high priority. Ephesians 4.16 says, From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, According to the effectual working of the measure of every part, make it increase of the body into the edifying of itself in love. This verse is talking about us, the body of Christ, the church. The church is the body of Christ. We make the church. Now, if it's true, if we're the church, just as in a, any structure, if you take out a stone, that wall's not as strong as it was. Now, it may not make it unstable, but you remo start mo moving enough stones, the structure starts to become unsound and it starts to fall apart. So if we're a stone in the church, in the body of Christ, and we're not in our place, we, we don't come to church. And as we are able to after COVID's passed, but we, we don't come, then not only are we not getting everything we could by being encouraged by our fellow brothers and sisters, we're weakening the whole body of Christ. <clears throat> so looking at our last point again, where it's preaching and teachings gained at the church. Preaching. There's two Greek words, two primary Greek words 
for preaching. One's keruso, which means to herald as a public crier would, to proclaim, to preach the gospel. And then there's euangelizo. Now, euangelizo means to announce the good news, especially the gospel, to declare the glad tidings, to preach the gospel. So preaching focuses on proclaiming or heralding the good news. Teaching, which the primary Greek word for that in the New Testament is didasko, means to hold discourse with, others to instruct, to give instruction, to instill doctrine. So it's focusing on instructing, giving doctrine. Preaching is more focused on proclaiming the good news, the gospel. So with that thought in mind, let's look at our church services. We have our Sunday morning church service. Well, normally the focus of a church, a Sunday morning church service is focused more on preaching, proclaiming or heralding the good news. Yes, there's some teaching, but that's not the primary focus normally. You move into Sunday evening. Well, now you get more of a balance. There's preaching, proclaiming the good news, but there's also instruction, teaching, more of a balance. But if you're only coming to church, if we only come to church on Sunday, guess what? We're missing the prime chances, the prime opportunities for instruction, for doctrine, for teaching. Wednesday nights, yeah, there's preaching, but the focus more on Wednesday night is, is teaching and, of course, prayer time. But then we have Sunday school. Now, the school, just the word school implies teaching, and there may be some teaching in Sunday school, but the primary focus of Sunday school is teaching, instruction, gaining insight into God's word, gaining doctrine into our lives. So if we're missing out on Sunday school, we're missing out on prime opportunity for gaining instruction in God's word. <clears throat> so with that in mind, the thought of preaching and teaching, just coming to Sunday morning, we're not going to get a lot of teaching. And then our vision is not going to be as clear, it's not going to be as godly, as what it could be because God's given his Bible and his church both. He knew we needed both to be able to gain God's vision in our life. So we want to be able to say, as the psalmist did in Psalm 119, 66 and 67, it said, teach me good judgment and knowledge. That's from God's word in the church. For I have believed thy commandments. So we've learned them and we believe them. Before I was afflicted and went astray. So at a point earlier, he was afflicted. He was humbled. He went astray. He didn't do right. But now have I kept thy word. By, we can do the same thing. We want to be able to say this, that, yeah, I went astray. I, I, went, I relied on my own vision. But now, by God's, studying God's word, coming to church, learning God's word, now I have kept thy word. <clears throat> and then we want to end up being able to say or hear God say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. 1 Kings 14.8 says, And rent the kingdom away from the house of David, and gave it thee. And yet thou hast not been as my servant David, and this was speaking of Jeroboam, who kept my commandments and who followed me with all his heart to do that only which was right in mine eyes. So that should be our prayer, our endeavor to strive for it, is to do what was right in God's eyes. So that means we can't rely on our own vision, it's God's vision, and that's only going to happen fully by studying God's word and come to church learning from others, seeking counsel from others, incorporating in our, our lives. And then 1 Kings 15, 5, because David did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord 
and turn not aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, save only in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. I wanted to end with that because we also have to remember that we're not going to be perfect. And God says that David did what was right. He followed him with his whole heart, but it also tells us he wasn't perfect. So, yeah, we're going to slip up from time to time. But 1 John makes it clear that he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We can come back, get things right, regain God's vision to live a life that's pleasing to God. All right, let's uh, have a word of prayer. Dear God, we pray that we would desire to live our life not by our own sight that will lead us astray, that deceives us, it's flawed, just like many of us with our physical vision is flawed, but we'll desire to incorporate your lens, your vision into our lives so that we will be honoring, glorifying to you and make decisions that are right in your eyes and not our own. And then we'll incorporate your word, study it, learn it on our own time and also come to the church. We just pray now that you'll be with our prayer time. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we'll have a few minutes of prayer now. You're welcome to come to the altar. You can pray in your seat. And at 8 o'clock, Scott, if you could come up and, and close our prayer time.